All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, going to we're we're holed up in the basement, and we're gonna do a podcast here. Um, it, we've we've I don't know when was the last time we posted. Last week. No, it's not too long ago. I feel like it's been a little while. I know we had a bit of a break in podcasts, um, only because of schedule, not certainly not because of um, choice. But we've just been really busy. You know, we're into or going into mid October now, and it's amazing how the last six weeks I would say flew by. Um, as soon as that September one rolls around, hunting season start, our minds shift a little bit. Admittedly, um, work certainly doesn't get any slower. Um, a lot of you know, but some of you might not know that we have another brand called Hodeg, which is um, deer hunting products. Um, it's a line of products for scent communication with deer, and that becomes obviously really prime um, during these months. Uh, it's a, it's just another brand of ours. Dogbone is one of them. Hodeg is the other. We have a couple other brands too that, that are just that we don't focus nearly as much on, but those two are the big ones, and they are relatively seasonal. So it, we struggle just like everybody else when it comes to balancing stuff. Um, so the podcast certainly, um, I, I don't want to say it takes less precedent, but precedence, but it also there is only so many hours, and so um, we've done our best, and we're going to continue to do our best. And I really wanted to do this podcast. For multiple reasons, I, I I think we needed to get another one or two out here, um, just because of the delay that's been going on. But I also did it because I'm I'm picking an email um, now. We haven't recorded podcasts for ours for Dogbone, the Dogbone podcast, but we have I have recorded two podcasts in this time frame as well um, in the last couple of weeks. One of them was with uh, Dr. Brooks Tiller. That was. Um, the Healthy Hunter, I think is the name of that podcast. Um, that was a really fun one. Uh, we did another Sporting Dog Talk podcast with Tony Peterson. Um, that was an interesting one. We talked um, more seasonal stuff. We talked some hunting stuff. We talked some bird stuff. Um, we always talk some training stuff. Um, hoping to get together with Tony here in the next couple of weeks, actually, um, to hunt together. We've hunted together in the past. Um, Tony and I have worked together quite a, on quite a few projects um, between Gundog, quite a few, um, a few other articles that he's written for Outdoor Life. Um, we did some stuff for Meat Eater. Um, so we've, we've worked together on, on things where Tony's writing articles for these different uh, outlets and he'll reach out to me and um, I'm really honored to be asked to contribute to it. So we did a podcast with him not too long ago. And from that came an email, um, and I got the email. It was a. It was almost two weeks ago. It was October first that I got the email. Um, so I am playing a lot of catch up on emails as well. So if you've got messages, um, emails, DMs, that kind of stuff out to me, I I am playing catch up. So um, some this one I got I got back to yesterday. It was sent to me on October first. So I'm embarrassed to say it's taking me that long, but they are. There's a lot of them. So I'm doing my best and I appreciate everybody's patience with it. But this came from a guy named Russell. Um, He sent me a message following the Sporting Dog Talk podcast. And I'll read it to you. It says, hello, Jeremy. I recently listened to the podcast Sporting Dog Talk. I really enjoyed it. Really wanted to get away and really want to get away from using the e-collar. Can you give me a little insight into your method of teaching a recall without an e-collar? And then he said, thank you, and it's signed Russell Fees, and it's NADKC Mid-South Test Coordinator. I didn't know what that meant. Um, I looked it up. Um, It is the North American Deutsch Kurzar Club. And so, and I, I, I am familiar a bit. I think we had someone that brought... We've we've had some different breeds that come come in for workshops. We've had po- uh, poodle pointers. We've had pointing griffons. We've had um, obviously lots of German short hairs. But we've had some some different quote unquote versatile hunting breeds. And so when I read this and I looked it up and it was the Deutsch Kurzar Club. Um, quite honestly, I got to be honest with you. I they look a lot like German short hairs to me. Are they the same? There's probably some, I'm assuming there's some differences to it. Uh, maybe it's just the name that, you know, that, that they're calling them that. But they, they do look very similar to the GSPs. Um, so anyway, I'm not an official on, on, on that style of dog by any means. Um, 
have worked with and seen and worked with a lot of owners that have them. So let me get back to the question. And, and so I responded back to him and I said, hey, man, I, first off, I really apologize for the long delay. I was out of town and playing a lot of catch up. Um, I think it's a really good question that he asked and quite honestly would have been difficult for me to a answer thoroughly by just writing a message back to him. Um, I, I don't write as well as I talk, and I'm not even saying I talk well, but um, I it's easier for me to get more information out verbally than it is by presenting some type of narrative on it. So I am going to answer it the best I can here today and probably be able to go into a few rabbit holes with it um, just because of the uh, delivery. And so one of the things he said back was no problem. He said um, he looks forward to it. He's new to podcasts. He calls it a new phenomenon, um, the podcast. Um, he, but he said, you know, this is something I look forward to. So um, obviously I sent him the link to our podcast and I let him know and I'll shoot him an email when, after we get this recorded and Wonder Boy gets it up live. But the reason, so let's go back to his question. And I, I, I think, I mean, before I touch on it specifically, I'm going to bring up the idea of Tony's podcast. Um, it never and I think Tony, I think Tony does it intentionally. I, first off, Tony's a very good host. Um, he has lots and lots of very good guests on his in his uh, on his podcast and over the over the last year or so when he's he's been doing it. Um, so I am honored to be a part of it and be asked to do it. We've done it twice now, um, along with another hunting podcast that he has. Um, but the sporting dog talk specifically, we've done twice, and it it never it never seems to evade me the idea of the collar comes up and you know everyone who's listening to this probably understands my opinion and my thoughts on them I don't use them um, and when I say collar I mean a shock collar I don't use them and I don't you know we're not going to get into turn this into a shock collar um, podcast today um, it's directly indirectly it will be because of the question but I do think it's really interesting um, it's exactly like a question like this is exactly why we talk about it as much as we do, which I don't think is that much. I definitely don't focus on it, um, but I definitely don't hide or skirt or try to um, avoid it because I do think that it's an important conversation. Um, we did a podcast with Ethan and Kat Pippett not too long ago from Standing Stone, who they use collars. Um, one of the, we did it live, and someone said you guys should do a debate. And I'd be all for it. Um, Tony Peterson probably should be the guy that puts it together. I, I, I've told him that. But um, but we, anyway, I have brought up the idea that I would be all for it. I have no problem with it. I think what might be disappointing to some people that listen to it is I won't. I won't. And, and you know, depends on who you talk with, um, Cat and you know, who you're talking with. Cat and Ethan, I don't think I know it wouldn't be. We won't, it won't get real heated. It won't get into an argument. It won't be what everyone. It won't be as entertaining as some might hope or think it would be. Um, I think it'd be pretty civil. Um, it'd be it's difference of opinions, and in today's world especially, um, for lots of reasons, I think that the idea of understanding the other side of things is very important. I don't think you have to always agree on stuff. That doesn't mean you have to be um, at odds with each other. Uh, I, I, the reason I probably would enjoy the idea of discussing it in a more formal situation is because I do think it would bring a lot of value to those listening. That's why. Um, I'm not here to convince someone that is set in their ways on something else. Um, but what I like about it, what I like about this question is, and I don't think Russell is alone in his when he says and these are his words because i've i've also heard some some things um you know that i i think some people like um i think there are some people out there that have have heard some of the stuff that we talk about and they like to assume or think that um i really want to push this on people i could care less what direction you go I say that and I sound real insensitive, and so I don't mean it to be that way. I mean, it's your choice, and I respect it. That's where I say I could care less. What I do care a lot about is for someone who is interested in finding out or trying or doing it without the collar, their training that is, and just doesn't know how. 
would prefer to do it but isn't sure how. That to me is where I feel a level of responsibility to share some of the things that we do and some of the success we have with it, where I learned it, because it wasn't, I, none of this stuff is original ideas. People have been doing this since the 1800s, 1700s. I mean, like, it's not anything new. There's nothing new and earth shattering about it. Um, there are lots of different ways to train dogs successfully. So nothing, I hate, I hate, I shouldn't say I hate, I really don't like the idea of, someone sent me a message yesterday and was like, I completely buy into your program. I want to follow your program. I want to know what I need to get complete your program. And I, I responded back to him and I said, nobody has their program. I mean, it's a branding effort these days. And I see that oftentimes. Um, that's a business model thing. I get it. But I, I am clear to let everyone know I have merely listened to, watched, practiced, taken from, dropped certain things from as many trainers as I possibly can expose myself to, and you pick and choose what works for you, and that becomes your style. There's no program out there that I've got that, you know, follow this program, you'll get results. No, I think you need to, I think we can offer you some ideas. Um, and so that's where it's gonna come into this, so that all brings full circle to this question. And I really like that he said, I really, wanted to get away from using an e-collar. I don't know that this guy, so I went to this guy's, um, I, I, I stalked him a little bit online, not him personally, but the NADKC, the Deutsch Kurzar. And you know, it's very similar to um, most of the versatile hunting dogs that I see. Um, I do think there's probably a very heavy influence here in the States anyway, um, of the use of the collar. And I do think it's interesting because none of the pictures on the website have a collar on. So, you know, it, uh, to me, that that is somewhat of subliminal advertising, which is very positive. I love the idea of that. You know, uh, to me, that's it's very natural to see a dog working without a collar, um, without the influence of that collar. So, so I like that. But anyway, let's get to his question. So he said, uh, listen to the podcast, really enjoyed it. Want to get away from using the collar? Can you give me a little insight into your method of teaching recall without a collar? And I so getting specifically to recall, I think recall is such a found, foundational, fundamental necessity. Um, it's one of those things that without it, with it you can branch off into a lot of things. Without it, you're really stuck um, because ultimately, and that and that goes for both in the field hunting as well as when you're not hunting. Um, and, and I think more and more we see it. I know for us, it's 100%. The use of the dog goes so far beyond the field. Um, their family members, their pets, um, they're going with us. They're spending a lot more time with us outside of the field or hunting scenario than they are in. So recall is an essential thing for that. It's just, it becomes, it's hard to enjoy them if you can't allow them some freedom. Now, freedom comes, um, freedom comes as something that's earned. You know, the idea, the understanding of trust in them, them trusting in you, that's all earned stuff. So specifically, how to how, give them some insight on how I teach recall without a, a collar. So I think there's a lot of different scenarios here, Russell. One of them is ideally, I think it starts out very, very young and there is no, there is no, um, there's no, means of control, whether it be a long lead or a leash or a collar, shock collar wise. And I won't really be able to talk about shock collar stuff because I've never used one, don't own one, never will. I, that, as far as I'm concerned, I won't. So, but with, so I think what, it ta what, what I think this is a generalization and a broad picture of training dogs in general. When they're little, I think, Every dog that I've ever worked with and, and seen, there is a level of confidence or lack of confidence that's there initially. Um, you know, I do think that puppies, I think that dogs are wired to find a good leader and follow them. And if they don't, they're wired to become one. And so I just think that's a DNA thing. I think that's a canine thing. So the starting point is a lot easier. It's a lot easier to do this stuff if we start out in the beginning forming and shaping the desired behavior. 
And so I'm going to go down that road to start out with because that's ideal. Let's say it's eight weeks old. The puppy comes home. Puppies have a tendency to, you know, especially a young one, when you uproot them and you bring them to your house, you've changed everything. There's no more dogs there to create this sense of security and boldness that they've grown up with the last eight, seven, eight weeks. There's no more mom there. And there probably hasn't been mom there for a few weeks prior to coming by you because they're, they're weaned out and they're not, they're not with mom anymore anyway. So, but these litter mates create, you know, it's a lot easier to be bold in a group than it is by yourself and removed and isolated. So when we take the puppies home, that's what we do. We remove them and we isolate them. And when they come back, they are looking for replacement for that pack. They're looking for replacement of their litter mates. They're looking for somebody that they can follow, and but they grow very quickly. And so when you bring them home, it t- might take, some dogs settle in in 24 hours, some dogs settle in in a week. It, it just depends. But as these dogs start to settle in, I think that's one of our biggest, most important things on my list is to get the dog comfortable when they come home. There's a couple things on my list. One of them is housebreaking. I don't want them pooping or peeing in my house. Beyond that, I want to get them comfortable and feel safe, trusting. Because I do believe heavily on the idea of trust. And I think trust is earned. And I think trust is goes both ways. I think we have to trust them and they have to trust us. And when you do, then you can start moving forward with um, everything, whether it be training formally or informally. So when I bring that puppy home, usually you can walk around and the puppy follows you. Like they don't want to be left alone first off. And second off, they just have this natural tendency to tail or tail around. They're not, they're not. So if you stop, they don't go wandering off real far. Usually they stop. And then if you start walking, they go, oh, there he goes. I got to go with them. And so those, that is where I start the idea of shaping behavior that's going to pay off later by doing what they're, by, by capitalizing on it, taking advantage of what they do naturally. So when these little puppies follow us around the yard at eight, nine, 10 weeks old, I turn that into an opportunity to start shaping what I would consider a formal recall at some point. It's informal at that point because I just walk around and they follow me. But it's at that moment, it's at that time, it's timing the action to whether it be a command or some type of tone or some type of audible reward. I like to recall with the whistle. Beep, 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 beep. I peep the whistle. And when I go beep, 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 beep on the whistle, I want the dogs to come to me. You you see any of our videos, when out of habit, a lot of times when a dog's returning with a retrieve, I'm on my whistle for just a short, I don't do it the whole way back, but I'll beep, 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 beep. And as they're coming to me, they hear that whistle. So it's it's a lot of classic conditioning like Pavlov ringing a bell and getting a dog to drool. It's timing the action with the cue. So whatever it is, the marking of, you know, it's the idea with clicker training. I don't do clicker training, but, um, you know, I, th- I do think some people use clicker training uh, for recall stuff, to shape and, shape and form and sharpen up um, the recall. It's the exact same concept, same idea. But so I'm walking around and I'm peeping the whistle as the puppy follows me. And out of necessity, out of, out of just a matter of it's happening all the time consistently, which habits form based on consistency, repetition and consistency will form a habit. So if you're consistently walking around puppy following you and hearing the peeping of the whistle, you do it long enough, then all of a sudden the dog hears the peep of the whistle and they can't help but come run to the whistle because that's what they always do. When they hear that peeping of the whistle, they're running to the, they're running to it. And so we start shaping it early. I also get in this habit of, as the puppies come to me, I welcome them in. I don't call a puppy all the way to me or walk away from a puppy and have a puppy come running all the way back to me. And then as they get there, I just turn the cold shoulder on them. I don't shun them once they return because they're going to run back to me and they're going to go, oh, that's weird. He, now he acts like he doesn't even like me. So one of the things I do is I make sure that I connect. When the puppy comes back to me, a lot of times I get right down on the ground. I'll get down to my knees. I'll welcome them in. And when they come up, I'll give them a big hug. Like, look at my kid. Like, I have a, I have a 18-month-old, roughly 18-month-old daughter right now. And she comes running to you, especially when she first sees you. Um, you know, if you haven't seen her, if you're picking her up from school and she sees you from across the playground thing, she'll come running to you. And she comes running and she puts her arms out and I can't help. It's just second nature. I get down, I scoop her up, I give her a big hug. 
And it's this, it's this reward for coming to me. And it's, you know, she doesn't know it, but it's a reward to me. <laughs> like I, I enjoy it as much or more than she does. But if you, if she came running across the playground after not seeing me all day and I'm here to pick her up and she sees me and she goes, oh, there's dad. And she comes running over to me. And just about before she gets to me, I turn and walk away from her and, or turn and don't pay attention to her. I kind of give her this cold shoulder. I do think that she's smart enough to realize, wait a minute, what I thought he, what, why is, why is he, why do I want to run over and get greeted this way? That doesn't feel very good. So what would you rather come running to? The person that welcomes you in and gives you this body language of come here, open my arms. I mean, it's literally body language of welcoming. It's literally getting down to their level. Um, we did a, a workshop video, one of our inside the workshop videos I remember distinctly. Uh, I talked about body language and I talked about the idea of standing tall and above someone or bending down and, and, and getting down to their level, especially if it's a young kid. And it's much more comforting and comfort, comfortable if you get down to that level. Well, that's all body language stuff. It's, it's telling a dog how you're receiving them. So that's early stuff. And I get these puppies in this habit. But then I can get into, you know, I can get into if dogs, not all dogs are warm and fuzzy. Um, most of the dogs that I train, I find that if you connect with them well, you can very quickly develop a bond and a trust and some warmth. I think a lot of times we're so, especially when it comes to hunting dogs, and I, I hear um, it's usually guys. Very rarely do I see this issue with a woman or a girl when it comes to training. It's usually guys, and it's because ego gets in the way. Guys' egos get in the way, and they got to be these big tough guys. And and these little dogs, you know, are really easy for some, for most people to warm up to. I mean, why wouldn't you? I love, I love them. I mean, I'm, I become very connected to them emotionally, but you can tell you watch any of my stuff. You listen to any of the stuff I talk about. They, they mean an awful lot to me. I'm, I take it very personal. If you're very cold to a dog and a dog is nothing more than a tool, that becomes a bit of an issue, I think, because that becomes a dog that goes, I don't know that they even like me. Like, I, and so dogs are uh, dogs are creatures. They're 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 living things. They are warm blooded. They have hearts. They're sympathetic. They will give us anything. They're they're empathetic. They're they're what there's that quote in the book Bill Terrence book. They they exemplify everything that man should be and isn't. Like they're loving. They're caring. They're warm. They're they're forgiving. They don't hold grudges. Like. They're, they're everything. They're, they're, and, and I believe that. So if you don't believe that, and then your question is, how come my dog doesn't want to come to me? It's, because, it's partially because of that relationship. And so, and I'm not saying that, Russell, you have that issue. I'm just saying that that's all stuff I take into consideration. So being warm, being friends, liking the dog, that all helps with recall. Now, some people get take that to an extreme, the opposite way, and we treat these little dogs we spoil them and we develop little brats. And when we get spoiled little brats, we get little dogs that want to play games and not play keep away. And now I was talking about emotionally, some dogs are much warmer, give us our give us their eyes a lot deeper than some. Some dogs are very independent. This is where this breeding, the breed part comes into it. And I do see with pointers a little bit more of an independence. I hear about it a lot. Um, I'm going to find out pretty quick next year. We're going to get a setter. Uh, so I'll see a little bit of that, little bit of that difference, I think, but I'll be honest with you. I've seen, I've seen and been able to work with lots and lots of breeds. And I think you can connect with every one of them. I don't buy for a second that, Oh, that's that type of dog. It doesn't connect. It doesn't have emotion. It doesn't, you don't, you're not able to develop that bond and trust and relation. I don't believe that for a second. I think some people think that, and then because they think that, they act on it. And when they act on it, they get results. And if those results are that, continue to build off of. If you don't by that point, so recently, Russell, I trained a, uh, I had a, my parents' dog, came to me at about four, what was Cedar, five months old? Something like that. About five months old when she came back. She, she had a pretty good recall when she started with me. It got bad within a couple weeks. But... It definitely was bad with the retrieve. 
So we had to do a lot of these things that I'm talking about right now. But one thing that I did with her, and you can do this with a little puppy. Um, I don't have any problem with it. I am not a treat trainer. I don't use treats. I don't, I think it's bribery. That's within reason. So I do shape a little bit of behavior with kibble when they're little. Like I have no problem for, I can do it for about a day or two where I'll take a little bit of kibble and I'll get the puppy to come to me and I'll hold it out in my fingers and I'll teach the dog to come right to my hand and then they kind of bump my fingers and I give them this little piece of kibble. I phase it out pretty quickly because I just, I'm not interested in carrying food around with me. I'm not interested in dogs relying and depending on getting food in order to do what I ask them to do. I just, again, I think it's bribery. I think it creates spoiled brats. If I had to give my kid, I always say, if I had to give my kid a dollar every time he did something right, I'd go broke and I'd get real tired of the idea of as soon as I don't give them a dollar, they're not doing what I ask them to do anymore. I want them to do things because they know what's right and they know it makes me happy. And so that's the idea with the dogs as well. So, but with my parents' dog here, it was six months old and I was really struggling with it. And she was a bit food driven. So I started using, I had these E3, um, it's called E3 canine, um, but they're, they make these they make these protein poppers and they make these this trail mix and they make these things. Um, they're a cattle ranch out of Kansas. Got a great mission. I really like what they're doing. Um, and so I've started buying some of their products and I use them with my dogs in the fall, midday while we're hunting. It's a energy boost. It's like giving them a granola bar or a Snickers. I think it gives them this extra boost of energy. It's not food, so it's not really getting heavy in their stomach. It's not running some risks of running the dogs with a full belly. But midday, obviously I'm giving them water and, and keeping them hydrated. I give them these, these one of them's called um, something ends. What is that one called? Um, roasted tips i think it's yeah. called or something like that but it's you know it's lung matter it's dried it's like a it's like a dehydrated beef jerky thing but so e3 is the company and i had a couple of people send me messages about it because i have shared that on my on our instagram um but e3 canine i think it's canine what is it called e3 i want to look at here i want to look it up on my phone i'll find out what it is but so those are things that I started using with this dog named Cedar. I took these small little pieces of these treats, basically, and I started to get her to come to me, and I gave her a little piece of this treat. Um, I did that as an extreme to start to change a dramatically poor behavior uh, and start to shape it. I weaned it out within about a week. Um, I still would go back to it. I had no problem going back to it, but that's another thing that that's one way that I had to kind of overcome a really poor habit that was formed in, in there that I had to reverse. So that's another way that I can do it, um, with an older dog or a dog that's got a little bit further down the road and, and maybe a little bit deeper entrenched undesirable habits. So those are some of the things that I do. I try to avoid, um, a check collar, I think a check collar is so temporary and I think dogs are so smart and I think they get in the way a lot. So I do try to avoid those. Um, I've got a buddy that uses a really light long line. So it's called E3 Canine Performance. That's what that's what those food, food treats are. Um, but I've got a buddy that uses a really, really light, like almost like a really fine clothesline. He uses that as a lead. He uses it as a long lead. Um, for me, it works for him really well because I do think I would prefer that because I don't think the dog has it, knows that it's on most of the time. It's so light in weight um, as opposed to a heavier check cord or check, um, check leash. But uh, those are things that I do try to avoid. Um, but I think, Russell, what I think it really boils down to is it's, it, it's taking the amount of time necessary to form the habit or reverse the habit that maybe is already there and doing it in a way, a location, a controlled environment that allows you to gain lots of pluses and not minuses. And when I say pluses and minuses, I mean, look at it this way. Like, look at it like you're keeping score. This is one thing I told the, my buddy last night. If you go outside and make retrieves and they go crappy and the dog runs off, for every retrieve that goes bad, it nullifies or negates every retrieve that went good and maybe even more so. So the idea of if you're keeping score is we want to, we want to add points. We want to, we want pluses. We want to be, we want to, we want a lot of positive things. 
When I say positive, I mean like good. Like they, they, it's the right behavior. So if you look at the number of times, again, getting back to repetition and consistency is going to form habits. In order to form a habit, you have to do something the majority of the time. It, it doesn't have to be 100%. I'd like it to be 100% as much as possible. But if it's only, you know, if it's an 80-20 mix, you're not going to get 80% results because you got 20% that isn't. So you're going to, er- that's going to kind of erode out. So an 80% and a 20%, if you add the two together, you got 100% and you divide it by two, you got 50%, right? So the results might be 50% of the time if you're an 80-20 mix because there's two variables there. Now one is heavier than the other. So it's maybe not 50-50, but it's maybe a 60% performance or 70% performance. It's not going to be 80 because that's ideal. You only Eight out of 10 is the best you're doing. You're not always going to be there. It's, so I look at these, and this is just like a, a, an idea to try to visually have you see. Every time you do something right, scoreboard. Every time it goes wrong, scoreboard. Sometimes the scoreboard positive is stronger than the scoreboard negative. Sometimes it's the opposite. But in the end, in order to get the behavior you're looking for, you have to be on the positive side of the scoreboard significantly in order to change behavior. And so I'm always looking at that stuff real general from like a 10,000 foot view, but I'm also looking at it in a real micro uh, way as, as well. And I'm also, and I'm always looking at it in the idea of these dogs are always learning. So if we work on, here's another example of it, and then I'm going to wrap this because, but if we work on recall for 10 to 15 minutes a day, and we control it, we do what we just talked about for the last half hour, we do a lot of those things well, and we get good results for that, for those 5, 10 repetitions in that 5, 10, 15 minute window, that's great. But what really has to happen is you have to then take that and build on it the rest of the day, the rest of the opportunities that you have with your dog. I do think that some of the best stuff I'm getting right now with Bella has to do with not the 15, 20 minute, 30 minute sessions that we're doing. Instead, it's I walked down back and forth from the warehouse to my house today, probably three or four times. And I brought Bella with twice. And I had her out just quartering. She was just allowed to kind of quarter and cast a little bit. And I gave her some really nice stop to the whistles. And she responded, excellent. Well, yesterday we worked on a little bit of stop to the whistle during a 15 minute formal session. And she didn't do nearly as well there as she did today. But today's were so sporadic and spread out, they were actually how it would go in the real world. And so I look at that and I go, it's transferring. It's just, she struggles with tests, let's say. She struggles with the classroom environment. She struggles with the training stuff. She doesn't do as well in formal training as she does in the real world when we apply what we've learned in the training. That doesn't mean that I can't do training because I have to have that stuff to establish these things, but then it's practicing it. So if you work on 10 to 15 minutes and we're the opposite, she does awesome during those 10 to 15 minutes, but she stinks when we do it any other time of the day. I look at that and I go, every time she does it poorly, regular, everyday, real life situations, it takes away from the little bit of positive, good stuff that you did during the session. So they're eroding each other. They're watering each other down. What the negative is watering down the positive. And so I want to make sure that we get as much accomplished in those short sessions as we can. As the dog's a little bit older, you usually can go a little bit longer. When they're little, it might be really short. It might be, you know, we might turn it into a lesson of, Go down the hallway, call them to you, give them a little kibble if that's what it took to motivate them, tell them how good they are. Go to the other end of the hallway, do the same thing, go back to the original spot in the hallway and do the same thing, and then you're done. And that could be done in about two or three minutes. So that might be a real great step in the right direction. But then if you go outside, immediately following that for the next 30, 40 hour long, and you let the dog just run around wild and you try to call them to you and they don't come and you turn it into trying to chase them down and catch them and all this stuff, that is so contradicting to what you've worked on in your session that in the end, your net is a negative. You are not on the positive side. So I just think it's, I look at all of that and I, I, I try to build it into the idea of 
Don't ever look at a time with the dog like it's not in training. Don't ever look at it look at it like it's an always an opportunity to try to gain something positively. So, uh, Russell, I hope that helps. Um, and, and if you do it, I, that's so to, to get away from using the collar. How do I do it without the collar? That's how I do it, and I think that it might take some time. Um, you know, I'm not going to say, I think some people say that the collar, you know, is, is magic. I hate that. It's not, it's not. And if you use it improperly, it will create bigger problems than you'll ever have in the first place. I really believe that. But I also think that the idea of understanding patience is really important. I don't, I don't want to look at the, the idea and I don't want people to think of it as, I don't have to really worry about recall right now. Let's just let the dog be a puppy. I hear that all the time. Let the puppy be a puppy. And then when they're almost out of control to the point where we can't handle them anymore, we'll knock them down. We'll beat them down. We'll light them up. We'll, we'll, we'll put the collar on them and we'll fix all those issues. I think that's unfair. I think that is not the way um, that I prefer to develop trust and build a relationship with a dog. It's just, I just don't like that. Um, I think it's I think it's become f way too often and way too common of a thing to see it happen that way, and I think that you can you can probably go through it, the proper way. You know, I don't know what the proper way of doing using a collar is to teach recall, but I always hear that people talk about the idea of well, you got to train the dog first before you put the collar on. And my answer is always, if you train the dog first, what do you need the collar for? Like. I think if you train the dog first and you're patient enough and you form that habit strong enough, there's really no reason ever to put the collar on. Um, I just think that, that that's that's my approach to it. And I've been able to do it, um, and I'm not the only one. I mean, there's lots and lots of people that do it that way. Um, so I hope that helps, Russell. Probably went a little bit longer than what we normally do here. I think we're at like 45 minutes, but I thought it was a great question. You're not the only one that wonders that. Um, so I appreciate you listening to this podcast. I appreciate you listening. You, know, you heard me originally on Sporting Dog Talk with Tony Peterson. I appreciate you listening to that as well. If there's, um, you know, it, these are great questions and, and we build a lot of the podcast off of questions. You know, every once in a while we've got other topics that come up too um, that I think are valuable. But the key is, and the important part of this particular piece of outlet, which would be the, the audio part, the, the podcast part, which Ben is actually turning into some video part too, because we're turning it into like a video blog on our YouTube channel. Um, but you know, different things, different platforms have different value. And the reality is, and the, the, what, it, what I like to try to think we're trying to do is when we get, when we field questions, when we get stuff from individuals, no one is the only one wondering. Like there's always lots of other people um, that probably have the exact same thing on their mind or same question. So Russell, I appreciate you asking. I hope that helps. Um, don't hesitate to follow back up with me if there's more specific stuff that you're interested in or if I missed it completely and um, you're looking for something else. But I uh, appreciate it, guys. Thanks so much for listening. Um, we, we, if you would do us the favor, if you wouldn't mind sharing this with someone that you think it might help, um, if you would, if you're on an app, if you could leave it a review, um, and what was it, a rating, I guess would be the other things, um, that all, that all helps when it comes to the techie part of it, when it comes to trying to grow the following and get it in, get it, have other people be aware of it. Um, I think the more people that are able to listen, my hope is the more people were able to help. And ultimately that is our goal. So appreciate it. Thank you guys for the support. We'll keep doing them.